I thought I'd give you something pretty to look at. This is an almost perfect copy of this manuscript. Um, and it's, it's just kind of a fun little collaboration I do with an artist who also happens to be my sister, which means I get very little to say about the art. Um, and I have to love it. Um, so this is what scientific manuscript looked like about 800 years ago. Um, this is the modern incarnation, and this is a project um, my sister and I are sort of pitching as the modern manuscript project. And we've, we sort of have the National Gallery of Scotland on board. They're sort of, sort of coming in mind, but we'll see where it goes. Um, so today I'm going to talk about something in my head that I call speed kills. Um, I grew up in Canada. We had this horrible driving, this horrible campaign to stop speeding tickets, so to get people to drive at a more moderate pace throughout my entire childhood. Um, but I grew up in the Northwest Territories where we had no media, so all I saw periodically while driving down for trips to the dentist once a year were these big signs on the side of the highway that said speed kills. It was, it was quite terrifying. It took me about a decade to work out an event. Um, so my, my research program is obsessed with predicting evolution in life-giving slime. Um, life-giving slime are photosynthetic microbes. If you're in fresh water, they, work, they get slimier than in salt water, generally. Um, but you can make that question much more specific. So instead of saying, we'd like to predict evolution all the things all the time, um, we can ask a much more tractable question um, that leads towards discrete projects that research councils will fund and department heads will, will consider a reason to hire someone, which is, what traits does natural selection act on and how will these traits change? And Basically, that's sort of asking, like, how do things like cell size or primary production or photosynthetic rates or calcification rates change? And can we predict which of those traits natural selection is going to look at, how long it will look at them, and where it will tell them to go? Um, and there are many, many ways you can ask and answer this question. My group uses a method called experimental evolution. And since very few people are crazy enough to do this, I will walk people through it. Um, so with experimental evolution, or evolution experiments, you're basically watching evolution in real time. If you're going to watch evolution in real time, you need things that are going to evolve over the course of preferably a single PhD or grant cycle. Um, so microbes are great. People also use fruit flies. People, and if they're extra crazy, they use gummies. But that, that does get you a free trip to Trinidad. Um, so you start with some base population. And that population can have standing genetic variants or not. In my experiments that I'm going to show you, it does not. And this is just because um, some of the other questions I'm asking have to do with distributions and mutational effects, so I need to know that all the mutations in my experiment are new mutations. Um, so that's, that's just bookkeeping. But you start off with ancestral populations, and the only important thing is that they be the same. Um, and if they have some sort of genetic variance, that you know what it is. And then you take replicate populations and you put them in a new environment and a control environment and you let them evolve for dozens or hundreds or thousands of generations, depending on what question you're asking. And at the end, you have these evolved populations. The reason we use evolving controls is because, like it or not, your population is going to adapt to the incubator, the brand of lights you buy, the media you use, the glassware you decide to use for that, all of that, okay? So in every single case, in every experiment I've done in the past 16 years where I've checked, if the control populations are different from the ancestors, the answer is always yes. And they're often as different from the ancestors as the ones that I've subjected to an environmental change. So that's how come in my experiments you don't see comparisons to ancestors. Um, because I, that comparison to ancestor doesn't tell you how much of the change is due to your general lab environment, how much is due to the environmental change you've imposed and want to study. I'm not saying that's always a bad comparison, um, but it's a bad comparison in photosynthetic eukaryotes. Um, here's how we hope the evolution experiment will pan out after we've devoted a year or three of our lives to it, which is if we measure something, some trait, such as growth rate or chlorophyll content in the new environment, what we do is we compare the evolved populations from the new environment to evolve populations from the control environment, and we see that their trait value is different. We grow them both in the new environment. So this is an example of adaptation, if this is growth rate, where populations evolve in the new environment, grow faster in the new environment than populations that evolved in a control environment. This is an example of a trade-off, where if I take these populations and transplant them back to the control environment, they actually slow down their growth rate. And here the control populations have a rapid growth rate in the control environment just to show the trade-off clearly. This is often called a direct response to selection. This is often called a correlated or indirect response to selection. It just means that evolution has happened, 
but natural selection wasn't acting directly on these trait values. Um, so the traits can change, but you're not going to argue that the population is maladapted to this environment because it never saw that environment. Natural selection didn't maladapt it. Um, so we need replicate population. What do we need to do this? Um, so we need replicate populations with the same starting point, um, or we need a good argument for using different starting points in a way to account for it. We need the same population at the beginning and the end of experiment. So we need the population at the end of the experiment to be a descendant of the population at the beginning of the experiment. Um, so if you're working with things that you can mark and recapture, you can do these experiments in the wild. If you're working with microbes, which are impossible to recapture, you can't really work with natural populations very well. Um, and that's just because you can't establish this line of descent very easily. Um, and you need a way to measure a good fitness proxy. Um, and you're going to see that actually all of the work in this talk came out of us measuring the catastrophically wrong fitness proxy um, and taking a long time to realize that we were doing it. And fitness is, is tricky. So fitness is the number of surviving offspring that an organism has. And that sounds super simple, right? But it's, then you get, you get your curlicues. It's the number of surviving offspring that themselves reproduce that an organism has in a given environment. Right, so it encompasses both fecundity, it encompasses survival, fecundity, and if there are other things present in that environment, their, their competitability, so their ability to stay alive and reproduce despite the presence of other things. Right? Um, and you can't measure all of these things. So what you have to do in your experiment is you take a best guess at what fitness is, and it's not an uninformed guess. Um, in our experiments, the way we try to rig it, um, or the way we account for this, really it makes it sound like we're cheating, but we're not, is we'll transfer our populations in batch culture so they never reach carrying capacity, but we're transferring them as fast as we can. So what we're selecting for is rapid growth um, and traits that contribute to rapid growth in that environment. And then we measure population growth rates with our fitness proxy, um, which people have been doing since the late 70s and holds up in most cases. So this is a cube. Now we're going to move on to real real biology. This is a cube that's been haunting my life since